again. Uh, the black velvet cloth of our sin. We need to be saved from that evil. And so, how are we saved? We're saved by grace. We learned this last week, grace and not of works. But now, we come to kind of the minutia, the kind of individual movements, as it were, the movements of a watch that brings about our salvation. So, as we look today, we're going to break down what salvation means. There's going to be a lot of T-I-O-N, shun words, big theological concepts. We'll be breaking those down. We'll be understanding them a little bit better. And so, if you follow in your outline, the first section is the states of salvation. The states of salvation. When we speak of being saved, or we are saved, when we speak of salvation, there's a couple different ways. I'm not sure what picture uh, comes up in your head. <clears throat> I think for a lot of people, they think of heaven, right? They think of a, some sort of final destination that they're working towards. When we're there, everything will be right. We cherish and we trust and we love the verse in Revelation where uh, we read that every tear shall be wiped away, every grief and sorrow turned to joy. We'll, 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 we'll be in that place of perfection. And for many people, that's what comes up in their mind when they think of salvation. But really, the Bible speaks of three states of salvation. One of them being glorification. One of them being glorification, which is, as I said, that state of, of perfection in heaven. We are glorified. <clears throat> we are glorified. We are finally made perfect. We are made without sin. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. We will be like him. That's that state of glorification, that the Lord Jesus goes to make a place for us. That place is a state of perfection, a state of glorification. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, When Christ, who is our life, some translations, some translations say, who is your life, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. We will be revealed. We will be unveiled. In the very same way that the Lord Jesus peeled back the veil, as it were, and revealed his glorified body uh, <clears throat> on the Mount of Transfiguration, so too will we be unveiled. We will be made fully like Christ. We will be made fully perfect. Fully without sin. Not only will we not sin, we will have no desire even to sin. What a joyous day it will be. And this is the ultimate end of our salvation. It ends with glorification. We remember in uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, he says wonderfully these comforting words, what, what the Lord began in you, this good work he began in you, he will bring to completion. He will bring to an ultimate end, and that is the glories that we look forward to in glorification. What is this second state listed? Sanctification. Sanctification. Sanctification is the process of being made more holy. Being made more holy. We are sanctifying ourselves. We remember and cherish, I hope, uh, the Lord Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17. He's praying a high priestly prayer to the Father on our behalf as the high priest of his people. He's making intercession for us which he does now at the right hand of the Father, and which he did continually through his life. But there in John chapter 17, we see it most fully and most beautifully. John chapter 17, he says to the Father, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. Sanctify them. He's pleading on our behalf to the Father, sanctify them. Make them more holy in the Father. 2 Thessalonians Chapter 2, verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith 
in the truth. You've been chosen from the beginning for salvation through sanctification. An active process, and we are sanctified by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the third member of the Trinity, who dwells within us. We're sanctified by the Spirit and by faith in the truth. Sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be saved. He will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. If anyone cleanses himself from these things, And this third point, this third point, justification, we are justified. Justified by faith alone. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, Therefore the law has become our tutor, our teacher, our lesson master, to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. So that we may be justified by faith. What does this mean, the law has become our tutor? The great divines would speak of the law, meaning the, the law of God, almost personified, as it were, in the law that God gave to Israel, that codified a perfect law, a perfect standard God held the people of Israel to. And of course, the moral law is that which he holds the Gentiles to, he holds us to, and by extension, all people, this moral law. Therefore, the law has become our tutor. How does it become our tutor? Well, it becomes our tutor by what we learned about last week, that sin is cosmic treason, in the words of R.C. Sproul. That sin is the quintessence of evil. The great divines would speak of the law as a mirror. You don't take a mirror off the wall to then pick the spot out of your teeth? No, a mirror is only used is to show you imperfections. Some of us, when we look in the mirror, we're almost frightened by what looks back, but it shows us how we are not perfect. And the law here is our tutor. It breaks us in such a way that it leads us to Christ. But don't forget the second half. It breaks us, it leads us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. So that we may be justified by faith. Romans chapter 3, verse 28, Paul again, hammering home this point. He says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Apart from works of the law. Now, a small little tangent. You may be asking me a question, what, what is this faith alone? Where is it in the Bible? Well, you do find it in the Bible. You find it in the book of James. The book of James, which Martin Luther nearly tossed out of the whole canon because he was at many times frustrated by it. But I, I think that's fair. I think it's fair. If we approach the book of James, we should be in many ways frustrated with what we hear. It's the very same way that as I read the Puritans, I can only do it for a short period of time because when I read them, they tell me how I should be more holy, how I should be more righteous do, by doing X, Y, and Z practically. That's a wonderful truth you find in the writings of the Puritans. They're very practical. Aiden knows what I'm saying, right? They're very practical. They say, oh, you're, you're, you're thinking of doing this. Well, the, actually, the right wisdom would be to do this thing, which is never what I, what I hear. And when you read the book of James, it reads almost like works, works, works. In fact, the phrase is of, of faith alone. Your man is not saved by faith alone. So what does this do to our understanding of God? Last week we spoke of grace. We spoke of works. We're not saved by works. In a sense, we are. We're saved by the works of Christ. So then why does James write? and speak of works and works. You're not saved by faith alone. But then Paul writes in Galatians 3.24 and Romans 3.28 and in a dozen other places in his writings that we're saved by faith. We're justified by faith. 
There seems to be this divide. <clears throat> I read one writer that said that the proposed problem that we find here would make you think that the divine is schizophrenic. In one way, the Bible, which is God's word to us, in one sense he is speaking in this way, and then in another book, in another chapter, he's arguing with himself. Is God some divine schizophrenic? Of course not. Get it out of your mind that God is a divine schizophrenic. Instead, what we would understand is that works are the offspring of our justification. We remember, well, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 9, climaxes there at the end with you've been saved. And then verse 10, you've been saved for good works. Good works come at the end. It's not, you know, incidental. It's consequential. It's very important that it comes at the end of the section. That works are the offspring of our faith in Christ. And so, as a, a quick kind of way of recapping, Paul speaks of our salvation, the Bible speaks and speaks well of our salvation in three ways. We will be saved, glorification, another verse, Romans 13, verse 11, do this knowing the time that it is already the, the hour for you to awaken from death, for now salvation is nearer to us. Salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. There's a great writer named James Ahi, or A, -A I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. He was a, a preacher in the South during the Civil War and was eventually executed because he spoke out against the Confederacy and their, uh, you know, kind of violation and twisting of biblical verses to support slavery. He was executed for that. And he writes this, Death to the Christian is the funeral of all his sorrows and evils, and the resurrection of all his joys. Uh, here, well, that's justification. There was one, and yes, yes sir. Please have that. Death is like my car, it gets me where I'm going. A wonderful line from Piper. A wonderful line from Piper. Because we know that final moment is the sweetest. And we get there, and that sweetness lasts forever. Glorification. The second way, sanctification. Another way of saying, we are being saved. We are being saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. If I could spend a moment on this, sanctification is made up of two parts chiefly. The first part being mortification. Mortification, which is a, a putting to death. Mortification, a putting to death. John Owen wrote the manual to mortification in his wonderful piece, Mortification of Sin in the Life of the Believer. That is a book if you ever want to feel really kind of bad about you. If you want to be humble, that's a book you read right there. He says, you must make it your daily duty to mortify sin, to kill it. Kill sin or sin will be killing you. Mortification, one half of sanctification, how we are being saved. The second half, just as important. When we mortify, we must then vivify, vivification. Vivification. It means a, a, bringing, a bringing to life. The old Puritans would say that this vivification is like nurturing a plant. It's like nurturing a plant. When you tear down the weeds in your garden, which is mortification, you're killing those evil things, you then plant new things. And you nurture them, because without you, they will die. If, if you don't if you're not careful and you're not looking ahead and there's a harsh frost and, and it freezes out your plants and they die, well, you weren't being vigilant. You weren't being careful. If you don't feed them the proper food, if you don't water them in a drought the way they must be, they will die. 
So you vivify, you bring them to life, you nurture them. And one of the things in our life that we should be nurturing after we've killed evil things, well, coming to Sunday school and, and, and learning, growing in our knowledge, coming to church, worshiping God collectively with the people of God, with our brothers and sisters. Praying regularly, studying our own Bible, growing in those ways. And this combined mortification and vivification, those are the two pillars upon which our sanctification rests. Thomas Watson, who wrote this wonderful treatise um, on repentance, called The Doctrine of Repentance, a wonderful book, he writes this, he says, after the fall, meaning the fall of man, the affections were misplaced on wrong, on wrong objects. In sanctification, they are turned into a sweet order and harmony. The grief placed on sin, the love on God, and the joy in heaven. As I spoke last week, by nature, we do evil. And so this is a reorganizing turning into a sweet order and harmony in the words of Thomas Watson. And finally, in our justification, we can say, just as we can say we will be saved, just as we can say we are being saved, we can say we have been saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, wonderfully, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. John Bunyan writes beautifully and wonderfully in, in a way that I, I think our souls should cry out in agreement. And indeed, this is one of the greatest mysteries of the world, that a righteousness that resides in heaven should justify me, a sinner on earth. A righteousness which resides in heaven should justify me, a sinner on earth. The grounds for our salvation in heaven. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This presents us with a problem. This presents us with a problem. As I spoke last week, we are sinners. We are sinners not because we sin, but we sin because we are sinners. How can a God save us? <clears throat> how can God, who is just and righteous and holy, how can he save sinners? How can the words of John Bunyan be true, that a righteousness that resides in heaven should justify me, a sinner on earth? How can this be true? is a problem, often called the divine dilemma, or the problem of divine forgiveness. We find this in Exodus chapter 34, if you would turn with me. Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7. Moses is replacing the tablets, which were broken. Okay, so I'm going to bring a hanky. I'm sweating up here. Exodus 34, starting in verse 5, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. Oh, we, that's good stuff. We love that. God is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in loving kindness. He keeps loving kindness for thousands. He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. That's what I'm talking about. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. This is a paradox. In two verses, a paradox. A paradox seemingly without an answer. No, there's no possibility of an answer. How can God on one hand be compassionate and gracious? How can he say 
he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, and in the same breath, say he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Who commits sin, transgressions? Who, who, who commits these things? Guilty people. So how are you going to not forgive, but then say you forgive? Is God, again, some divine schizophrenic? By no means. By no means. What is the answer? Then? The answer that is something that we find known as the Great Exchange. Hotchkiss last week spoke of it. I didn't. Uh, I don't send him my notes or anything, so he, he didn't steal that from me. He may have. He may have quoted me for for nearly three minutes last week, but uh, he he didn't uh, steal that. The Great Exchange, something pioneered by Martin Luther, a, a kind of theological frame of thought, and it deals with justification. I, I have here two words. One is a Latin word, justificare, and the other one is a Greek word, dikaiosune. Justificare and dikaiosune. And kind of how we have these two words is kind of a bit of a, a, an interesting story. As we know, the New Testament written in Koine Greek, ancient Greek, and was used for hundreds of years. But by the end of the fourth century, Latin was becoming more of the kind of church language, more unified way of speaking as, as uh, Christianity spread more into the west of the Roman Empire. Latin was more in use. So the Pope at the time uh, commanded a man, a monk named Jerome, to write a Latin translation. He was a master of three languages, as Augustine said. He's a master of Hebrew, he's a master of Greek, and he's a master of Latin. So he writes a Latin Vulgate, as it's called, which for over a thousand years was the version of the Bible that the Catholic Church used. And for the most part, the Vulgate is decent. It's a great effort, especially at the end of the fourth century. He did well. But he made some major mistakes, accidents, I'm sure. But these accidents, which were minor seeds, grew up into a whole tree of pernicious evil. And one of them is this word that he uses for justify, justificare. It comes from the Roman legal system, specifically the Roman legal system, where a court would say a man was justified after he paid his way. If he committed a crime, it was after he did his time after he repaid wages, he stole, whatever it was, he did his time, then and only then was he justified. He was declared justified at the end after he had done his works. And so this then spreads into a whole, as I said, pernicious evil in the Catholic Church that is then addressed chiefly here in the Reformation with Martin Luther. When he goes back to studying the original languages, when he goes back to studying the writings of, of, of Augustine of Hippo, we spoke of last week, as he goes back to studying these things, he finds the word in Greek is not justificare, obviously that's a Latin word, but it's not even the same definition. It's similar, but it's not the same. Dikaiosune. Dikaiosune. This is the word from the original text that Paul uses and this is, again, taken from a courtroom, a courtroom, but from the Greek courtroom, not the Roman one, an important difference in the legal system. In the Greek courtroom, a, a, a criminal is declared justified, declared justified. Before they've served their time, before they've done anything, they're declared justified. And so this is, one of the ways that we can understand this is as a forensic justification, a forensic declaration of justification. And why, why does this matter? Why, why is this important? Why am I even talking about this? Because this is how God forgives. A righteous God who is just and holy and all the wonderful attributes that we attribute to our Father. One of his attributes is he is judge. 
is judge. And I know, I, I take great comfort in this. Vengeance is mine, declares the Almighty. When I look at the world and I see heinous evil, I live five minutes away from where a, a horrible murder took place, just like last month and on Moog Road in Trinity. And that guy may not see the level of justice that I think he should see now, but I know my God who reigns in the heavens is just, and he will deal with evil men. So then my question is, how does he deal with us as evil men? How can he deal with us? And it is bound up in the great exchange. And in this important differentiation between justificare, the Roman way of justifying, and dikaiosune, the Greek way of justifying, which we can just say is the biblical way of justifying. In this great exchange, if you remember from last week, I just only spoke about it for a moment, but it's my evil, my black velvet cloth, again, transferred onto Christ and his lovely robes placed on me. When God looks at me, he sees the righteousness, the glory, the, the satisfaction of his demands that are bound up in his son. And when he looks at Christ, he sees that evil. So this is the answer to that divine conundrum. The divine problem of forgiveness that we read in Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7. How can God forgive me? Because I'm no longer guilty. Because I'm no longer full of sin and iniquity and transgressions. Instead, I am wrapped and clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And on that account, God can look at me and say, justified. And at the same token, he can look at Christ and he can say, condemned. And this is what we see at the cross. The cross soaks up that evil. It is crushing down on the weight of Christ. He suffers for a few short hours, but what he suffers and experiences is beyond imagination. In those few hours, he suffers the eternal weight of torment that we would suffer in. One of the professors at Trinity College of Florida, Dr. Woodward, recently retired. He's a, a big science guy. And I took him for uh, Life and Revelation of Christ, one of the classes at Trinity. Wonderful class, and wonderful by Dr. Woodward. And when we get to Christ's death, he goes into this whole scientific way of speaking, where it, it floors you, really. He says, it was a few short hours that the Lord Jesus hung on the cross. But with divine power and divine justice, the Father could lengthen that three hours infinitely. It breaks the mind. We cannot understand truly what the Lord Jesus went through. But all we know is he took my sin. And he took your sin in this great exchange. And so what we have is now what Martin Luther called estitia aliena, an alien righteousness. A righteousness which is not mine. I didn't earn it. There's no way I could have earned it. It's an alien righteousness. It comes from Christ only. And this alien righteousness puts us in the presence of God. Another Latin phrase, quorum Deo. Quorum Deo. In the presence of God. I am righteous. And I can only be righteous because of this great exchange. Because I've been justified. Again, the three states of salvation. The three ways of speaking that we will be saved. We are being saved, but I have been saved. You have been saved. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 sums it all up most perfectly, I think. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, having been justified by faith. Martin Luther said that the doctrine of justification by faith alone was the hinge upon which the whole of Christianity swung. You can have no door without a hinge, and you cannot have Christianity. You cannot have the Bible without the doctrine of justification by faith alone. I have a tattoo here on my arm. Simul justice et peccator. Latin, it means simultaneously, at the same time, justified and sinner. In the Roman system, your justification is part of a process. You have to justify it and maintain it and build your way up. Falling down when you commit some venial sins, falling all the way down into condemnation with some mortal sins. This is where the doctrine of purgatory comes from. That you, you weren't quite perfect when you were in your life. You, you kind of had some ups and downs, and you, know, you were closer to glorification than when you started. But you got to burn away those other sins. you got to burn that off, and that's what purgatory is for. You'll make it, but after some time. But the Bible says no. The Bible doesn't say that. It says, yes, you will be saved. You're not yet perfect. You're, you're becoming more perfect, we pray, through sanctification, which is the will of God for our life, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The will of God for your life is your sanctification. But all of this hinges, all of it rests on the truth that you have been saved through faith in Christ. The last slide down here, there is. Here is the good news that lifts burdens and gives joy and makes strong from John Piper. The good news, the gospel, the news of a of a a messenger that a battle had been won by your empire over the opposing empire, that's the roots of the word euangelion. The gospel is no good news if it says you could lose it. The good news is only good news if it says it is done. To tell us by the words that Christ cries out from the cross, it is done. And with that, I am done. Any questions? Yes. Um, what's your ailing life again? The Latin for it? Yeah. Oh, man. I was able to pronounce it once, and that's why I didn't say it again. I think it's pronounced justitia aliena. So it's I U S T I T I A, and then alien with an A at the end. Is how you read. I heard R.C. Sproul pronounce it, and he said justitia, so I'm going with that. Because he probably knows himself. Right, any other questions? Any concerns? Any roadside problems? All right. Well, I did my very best. We're, I'm under 1040, so I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, all right. We're going to head over to some of us, I think. I think the worship people will stay here, and then we're going to head over to the fellowship hall. All right. God bless.